Welcome back, Tributes, to episode 73 of Into the Arena. I'm Holly. I'm Emily. And we're back for part two, the prize. But before we dive in, we have some important announcements. Like always, join us for Trivia Talk every Thursday, 6.30 Pacific, 9.30 Eastern. You know what's going on. We're talking ballad. It's leading up. These next few weeks are going to be crazy. We're a month mm -hmm. out, less than a month out. So join us for Trivia Talk. We only have a few more of those left. Yeah, let's dive in to the prize. Dun, dun, dun. Emily and I thought it would be kind of fun to kind of separate parts of this in a different way than we did with part one, the mentor, because in part two, we have the actual Hunger Games, 10th Hunger Games take place. Mm -hmm. I think the first time reading it, I was completely lost. And it wasn't until this time reading it over and over and over. Like I've read it so many times. But there's so many name drops. There's so many things happening. And because we're not actually following Lucy Gray in particular in the arena, we're kind of just, we're viewers. So mm -hmm. we took the time to channel our inner Lucky and Lepidus. <laughs> <laughs> and we are going to be doing a breakdown, complete breakdown of the games in a few minutes or less. So we're going to try we to go fast. This. We're going to do this. Day one, we begin. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Marcus is hanging from a pole in the middle of the arena. Oh, no. But Reaper grabs a pitchfork and is ready to be on the offensive while all the other tributes run away at the start of the games. Everyone disappears until Lamina from District 7 emerges from the tunnels. She's acting strangely calm, but she chooses a knife and an axe and makes her way to one of the poles where Marcus's body is. She climbs up the pole, swings down on Marcus, and kills Marcus instantly. Then the drone delivers water. As you can see, if you're watching, I'm wearing my drone shirt. It's embarrassing because the drone drops the water completely away from the pole. So Lamina has no access to water. So Lamina is just chilling on the pole. Then we have our District 3 tributes, Cirque and Tesli, who arrive, dun dun dun. And they take the drones apart and they run away with their water and bread that Urban delivers. So we're like, what are they doing with these drones? Reaper then appears carrying Dill, who is Felix Ravenstill's tribute, in his arms because they're both district partners. But then Dill begins coughing and Treach appears and takes the water from Dill only to realize that Dill has just died from tuberculosis with blood flowing from her mouth. So that is the end of day one. Night one, Sejanus enters the arena and Coriolanus blazes after him. They have a little combo and they end up starting to carry Marcus's body out of the arena. Suddenly Bobbin brings his knife down on Coriolanus. Coriolanus grabs a two by four and beats Bobbin with it, bringing it down and down again. Coriolanus reaches the barricade when Coral and Mizzen and Tanner are armed and they chase after them. And Tanner ends up cutting the back of Sejanus's leg open. That is all in day one. So day two, <laughs> we get to day two and the tributes discover that Marcus's body is gone. What the heck is their foul play? Bobbin is dead. His face is so swollen, it was unrecognizable. So that is Snow's first kill. We are at the halfway mark though, folks. 12 tributes left. Coral and Mizzen collect food from the drones. And then in the late afternoon, the District 5 tribute girl makes her way to the bleachers. This is when Mizzen, Coral, and Tanner take that opportunity and begin their hunt. Coral kills the District 5 girl with a trident to the throat. And then Jessup runs out into the open as they all disappear. But something's strange about him. Lucy Gray scrambles through the arena and it looks like Jessup's chasing him. Jessup begins to chase after Lucy Gray and he opens gashes on his body, stumbling and tripping because he can't control himself. When we realize, quote, rabid boy, trapped girl, bombed out building. Dun, dun, dun. Coriolanus sends Lucy Gray water because he realized Lucy Gray is thirsty. However, he has rabies. He's scared of water. So then Lysistrata and Coriolanus team up to send drone after drone of water, sending water out of the wazoo here in the capital. 
And then Lucy Gray, unfortunately, talks to Jessup and says she'll take over watch as he passes away slowly, only to end day two. Lamina, she's still up there on the beam. She's sunburned. She's not doing too well. And Reaper and Lamina end up having a little conversation with each other. And Reaper ends up going to the flag of Panem and cuts it down with his knife, which really upsets everybody. Reaper and Lamina end up negotiating a little bit and she gives him a piece of bread and some cheese and he gives her the piece of the flag to use as a blanket. Mizzen and Tanner and Coral come out and Lamina's looking out for Reaper who ends up giving her thanks and then leaves. Coral, Mizzen, and Tanner get some food from their mentors. The three of them gather under Lamina's beam. They're planning something. The three huddle together. Tanner gets the tridents and they split up. Lamina reaches the end of her beam and she swings the axe at Coral and Tanner throws his tridents up at the beam. Lamina swings and hits Mizzen's knee and Mizzen falls off the beam but he catches himself. Coral makes it to the top and grabs the trident. Coral stabs Lamina with the trident in the abdomen and Lamina ends up falling to her death. So Coral crosses to Mizzen and helps him to safety and Tanner is over here celebrating over Lamina's dead body. He goes in for a high five but he gets stabbed in the back literally. Coral <laughs> drives the trident into Tanner's back. What? Mizzen finishes with Tanner with a knife to the neck, so he's dead. Then they all retreat into the tunnels. There are eight tributes left at this point. Treach ends up taking Lamina's axe. Tesli grabs another fallen drone. She's planning something with those drones. And then later in the afternoon, Reaper wanders out of the barricade again. He sees the dead bodies, he's confused, and he starts arranging them kind of together, sort of like a morgue area. And he ends up cutting up the flag more and puts it over the tribute's bodies. Then he also ends up putting the flag around his neck. I remember reading that for the first time being like, what? Cut to day four. Reaper brings Jessup's body to the pile, which happens overnight. And then we see Wovi from District 8 emerge. She's skeletal looking and she has an empty water bottle with her. Then her mentor is like, oh, it's just a stealth strategy. And the drones begin to deliver food and water to her because she was hiding and she was playing it smart. But all of a sudden we see a silver stream come down Wobie's mouth and she goes still and dies. We are at the final seven tributes, everyone. It's lunchtime. And then finally later, Reaper appears with his flag cape. Reaper suspects there could be some foul play here. Why was there a silver stream mm. of poison coming down her mouth? Then Mizzen and Coral appear and eat and drink Wobie's leftovers. Not that water bottle, but the rest of the food that was delivered with the drones. Mizzen walks with a limp because he was obviously cut in the leg and Reaper sits in the arena stands while Tesla and Stark poke around the rubble. Treach runs through the tunnel, freaking out, and enters the middle of the arena. And we discover that snakes are being dropped into the arena. And Tesla runs and screams as all these snakes are just randomly dropped into the arena. Colorful snakes. She runs up a pole while Cirque is overtaken by the snakes. So we are down to the final six tributes. Mizzen and Coral run. The snakes are able to attack Coral as Coral calls for help and then Mizzen climbs a pole. Then we have Lucy Gray emerge from the stand singing with a half dozen snakes following her and the snakes begin to slither around her migrating toward Lucy Gray where all these bright bodies begin to overtake her and she sings some of the snakes in her dress. And then we reach day five, the final day of the 10th Hunger Games. In the morning, everyone in the audience can see all of the snakes that have died over the night. Rainbow of snakes littering the arena. We've got Mizzen sleeping. We've got Treach and Reaper. They received food, but Reaper didn't want to take it or eat it. Pesley ends up arriving with a drone and attacks Mizzen on the pole with the drone. All the drones begin going at Mizzen's face. Not Mizzen the falls special delivery. And breaks his neck on contact. Treach emerges while the audience is distracted and brings his axe down on Tesli in one swing. So she's out. Reaper ends up sleeping after he moved all of the bodies to his morgue area. And Lucy Gray enters the center of the arena. She tries to count to figure out how many tributes are left in the games. And Treach goes up behind her and runs at her. Lucy Gray, in what looks like a hug, but she secretly has been keeping 
a snake friend warm and uses it to bite Treach. So Treach ends up dying. So then we're left with the final two tributes. So we've got Reaper and Lucy Gray. They're kind of in like a standoff. They're like on opposite areas of the arena. Lucy Gray is trying to run away from Reaper. She's got a piece of the flag so that Reaper is chasing after her. Reaper ends up getting super tired and he ends up collapsing, pulls the flag over him, and he's dead. So the winner of the 10th Annual Hunger Games ends up being Lucy Gray Baird. Which is Emily right now. Because if you haven't been able to see, if you're watching, Emily is wearing her beautiful Lucy Gray Lucy cosplay. Lucy Gray cosplay. Yeah. Yes. It's so very we nice. have we have our Lucy Gray stan here, which I think is so iconic, just a side note, because remember when you said Lucy Gray like wasn't your character and now you're in love with her costumes and outfits, and I'm so obsessed with this turn to Lucy Gray. She's an icon and I love, She's an love icon. her outfits. Honestly, I put on the rainbow dress and I'm like, yeah, maybe I would act like Lucy Gray too. Like, I feel it. I feel the main character energy. <laughs> so that is Lepidus and Lucky's 10th annual Hunger Games explanation. But now let's dive in and I feel like we should talk a little bit more about the rest of part two because part two is long. Part two takes up the entire game's But on top of that, we're looking at Snow's life. We're looking at everything that's going along in his journey. And really, the games are kind of just a side. Yeah, they're sort of happening alongside Snow's life. So we begin part two with chapter 11, which chapter 10 had just finished and part one had just finished with Lucy Gray saying, you need to actually start considering me. Coriolanus is here and Corio really only hope that Lucy Gray would bring him attention, but he never actually thought that she could win. So they start to strategize a bit here. Mm -hmm. And I like this because it it reminds me of the new promos. Like we've been getting a lot of promo. I can't even keep up with the clips that we've gotten because we've seen so much already. But just that line of, in the book, it says, we think of a strategy. So I like that idea of them working together as a team. And it reminds me of that new promo of them as a team because- that's what I want to see is that team interaction between Lucy Gray and Coriolanus. And then we get a convo with Dr. Gull and the students again, talking about the war, how it'll never end, how it needs to be about control, and they need to keep the Hunger Games going to control the ongoing war indefinitely. I think an interesting line from Dr. Gall was wars are one with heads, not hearts. And that's mm-hmm. a big thing. I think she's trying to Like we see Dr. Gall kind of playing her hand in her class a lot more and trying to figure out and turn them all into more capital thinking. Because right now, even some of the capital students and mentors, I should say. They're a little wary of the Hunger Mm -hmm. Games. Yeah. When you say the line about heads and not hearts, I immediately think of Sejanus. And I mean, Mm -hmm. Dr. Gall's right. Sejanus needs to be leading a little bit more with his head than his heart. Sejanus, my boy, is a hot mess in part two. Yeah, poor Sejanus. I mean, I get it. And so we have, I think, one of my favorite and kind of, I think, underestimated mentors is Lysistrata, because that's when Lysistrata kind of starts chiming in. And she's really, I think her kind of side story is interesting as well, because we come to find out that she almost has feelings for Jessup. Um, He saved her life. Mm -hmm. And um, she reminds Coriolanus that Lucy Gray and Jessup saved their lives. And so I think that that story of recognizing that they're not just animals, they are humans, like these tributes are humans, is a huge part. And Lysistrata plays a huge part in voicing that. And then Corio goes to visit Pluribus Bell for a guitar to borrow for Lucy Gray. And he gets a little bit of a flashback because he finds out that Casca Highbottom and uh, Snow's father um, used to hang out in Pluribus's club and were friends. He's like, I don't know if I believe that. That doesn't really make sense. That doesn't compute. Mm -hmm. He's like, you're talking about my dad? Lucy Gray ends up performing at the interviews, the ballad of Lucy Gray Baird, and Snow gets jealous. I love this. That chapter ending, chapter 11 ending is, but what he really felt was jealous which I feel like is kind of like no offense to Suzanne like kind of a flop for her chapter endings but I think it's a really important line because 
a lot of what we're going to talk about in today's episode is Coriolanus's possessiveness over Lucy Gray. And that initial possessiveness starts, but then it kind of transforms into jealousy. And so in chapter 12, Corio is not happy with Lucy Gray's performance at all. He feels absolutely betrayed and humiliated, is what he says. And we get that line from Tigress that we all did things we weren't proud of. Because Snow is like trying to figure out what a lot of her song means. What did she get up to in District 12? Tigress has a lot of compassion for her, but he doesn't want to hear that Tigress maybe made sacrifices for him in that way. It kind of makes me wonder, like, does he think that because he doesn't want to owe Tigress anything? Or does he think that because he's disgusted by what Tigress may have done? I think he just views it as he doesn't want to be viewed as a survivor. I think that kind of taints the snow name in his opinion. He doesn't want struggle to be associated with his name, I guess. And there's just a little mention that the elevator in their apartment starts building. There's this tension, another side story that begins that he's worried about the apartment selling with the increase in taxes that's required to live there. He goes to write his essay for Dr. Ball. little paper on what he loved about the war. (laughs) You know, just like, what did you like? What was your favorite part about the war? Which some of my favorite quotes in part two come from this moment. We learn a lot about who Snow is and like the direction that he's going in, how he's determining his values. The security that could only come with power, the ability to control things. Yes, that was what he loved most of all. He's all about control. And I think we really start to see it so clearly in part two. And he's willing to do anything to be in control. Later in that same chapter, he says, what he desired has little to do with nobility and everything to do with control. He's going to sacrifice whatever morals he has or any sense of nobility in order to be in control in the situation and feel safe, comfortable. Which I think is really important to that possessiveness part that Mm -hmm. we'll talk about. Um, because he wants to control every aspect of his life. He wants to control Tigress. He wants to control Grandmam. He wants to control the outcome of the games. He wants to control his appearance. It all comes back to this like appearance and reality representation as well. He's so attracted to the allure of Lucy Gray because she is different. She's a little unpredictable. She's something new. I think that's that's the attraction for him. But at the same time, He's all about control. And so he doesn't really like that unpredictability. He wants to just control her. I think it's interesting because then in the same part where he's writing the essay, he notes a lot of satisfaction coming from seeing his enemy fail, the districts. So we're starting to see, I think, a little bit, like I kind of picture his brain, not pure, but it kind of is, he's just trying to survive. And then I feel like in part two, you start to see this hatred and these subliminal messages from Dr. Gall, like self-preservation, chaos, control, kind of slide into his mind and attack him from that scared point of view. Like he's scared of not having this control. Like you said, he's scared of this Mm -hmm. chaos. At the end of chapter 12, we end up getting the start of the final scene between Snow and Lucy Gray before they go into the arena. It's a really emotional scene like you really feel Mm -hmm. for Lucy Gray she has that line you know I don't want to die I think it's really setting in for her what she's about to have to face and Snow ends up giving her the rose compact insinuating Mm -hmm. that she should put the rat poison in it and then they were talking a lot about like we're gonna win this together like Mm -hmm. we'll win together Lucy Gray is what Corio says and then another part just at the end of chapter 12 that I think is important is there's this quote Corio says she was always so careful with her appearance we're talking about Lucy Gray not vain really just conscious and so we're starting to see Lucy Gray after he says we're going to win this together she starts to put on that playing card and that playing face again, that poker face, I guess. Mm -hmm. Which which brings us to chapter 13. Which they make out at the beginning of. (laughs) I know, I was like, okay, like young love. It makes me think of, of, you know, Hamish going up to Seneca. Young love. love. Do you realize like in that scene, he gets so close to him. He's like, 
young love. It does. It's like, what? <laughs> like, whoa, chill. <laughs> but Lucy Gray goes, the only boy my heart has a sweet spot for is you. And then they kiss. So you think she's really just trying to play him at this point? I don't know. I don't know. Because now I'm like, I don't know if she's trying to play him. Because I think the direction that we're getting from the movie, because now the movie is canon as well. I think um, they're really going with it being a super genuine love yeah. story. But Which maybe is what I'm getting. It, that's just the marketing aspect of it. I'm hoping that they're going to kind of drop some hints from what we mm-hmm. haven't seen in promo that will make us question it still because we question it in the book but I also think to Francis Lawrence's line where he says Lucy Gray's an entertainer or performer she wears her heart on her sleeve I think that sort of goes in that argument that she is just putting on a show so I think that could maybe be one but that's just how I've seen that quote in a sense I kind of feel there is realness there but she has to lean into it extra in order to make sure that he's going to do whatever he can to save her. I love that line that we get after they separate and he says, I think she's fallen in love with me. Oh my god! He's, like, he's like, delusional. <laughs> he's such a, like, he's like a giddy schoolgirl, but like he doesn't want to admit it. He's just like too good for it. It's like, does Snow have these genuine feelings? I think that Snow has these genuine feelings, but does... Lucy Gray have these genuine feelings? I don't yeah, know. I think he does, but he just doesn't, he doesn't want to admit it mm-hmm. because he's so about control. And when you fall for someone, I feel like you start to kind of lose that control. You know, someone can mm-hmm. hurt you. Someone can influence your emotions. Yeah, and play on your vulnerabilities, which Mm -hmm. he is very vulnerable. And I think is another important point, I know it's in part two, is um, talking about Tigress's backstory with love and how she had a sweetheart, but she never brought him around the apartment because they had so much to hide. And that ended up in their relationship failing. And so Snow kind of reflects a lot on that saying like, he has a lot of vulnerabilities and there's no way that he could bring a sweetheart around. But then another interesting part about chapter 13 is Snow begins to cross off the names of not only the tributes, but the mentors Mm. with them. He crosses them off together, which I think I never really picked up on. He didn't want to do it in part one. He didn't want to cross out mentors' names. He only, he instantly crossed out tributes' names, but not mentors' names. And then suddenly in part two, he's just like, I can just draw them off all at once. And he Mm -hmm. combines them, which kind of makes it look like the value of their lives are the same to him, at least to me. And so that was kind of an interesting part right there where he's seeing himself as not only better than the district people, but capital citizens and classmates as well. He sees himself as better than them. So then we've got the start of the games. The mentors get the communicups. Clemencia is back. <laughs> they make up. Oh my gosh. Clemencia. I feel like Snow starts to really go to work to explain to the audience that Lucy Gray is special. She's not really district. She's even maybe a little bit closer to capital. So that's mm-hmm. he's starting his strategy there. Lysistrata gets frustrated because he's pushing Lucy Gray as this one Mm. tribute but she's like hello Jessup and her are supposed to be allies and he's like but what's an ally like what's an ally what? <laughs> you have an ally <laughs> and then Sejanus enters and that's when we get the quote all eyes move to the camera riveted as it slowly zoomed into the pair of steel poles not far from the main entrance of the arena they were 20 feet high joined by a cross beam of similar length at the center of the structure Marcus hung from manacled wrists so battered and bloody that at first Coriolanus thought they were displaying his corpse. Then Marcus's swollen lips began to move, showing his broken teeth and leaving little doubt he was still alive. That's a Suzanne Collins chapter ending. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even everyone feels sick. We see it in the trailer. It's when Sejanus throws the chairs and he goes, you're a mad star, stop out. Mm-hmm. That should be like a Halloween thing. <laughs> but... <laughs> And Coriolanus even feels sick about it. Everyone is shocked. It's going to be insane to see in the theater. Janus hurls his chair at the screen. The games begin 
And Coriolanus goes, why the heck am I continued to be categorized as this, this man's friend? <laughs> like, <laughs> why am I with him? <laughs> oh my gosh. So funny. So funny. We've kind of talked about the games a little bit, but mm-hmm. eventually Snow goes home and Mrs. Plinth is there. They end up seeing Sejanus on the TV screen. So Sejanus has entered the arena. He went into the arena, you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. (laughs) My boy's right there. That's another ending. I like that ending. And so Sejanus enters the arena and Coriolanus sees him and he's like, what the heck is this man doing? And Ma goes, that's a tradition to put breadcrumbs over Mm. the bodies of your dead as they travel on their journey to whatever life is next. And um, Coriolanus makes this line, something along the lines of, wow, somebody just died from starvation. Get out the bread and let's get these crumbs on. How wasteful. (laughs) I'm like, come on, man. (laughs) He's just so heartless. So funny and terrible. I know. But that's the thing. Suzanne makes him likable in the sense that you hate him. Like, dislikable. She makes him so dislikable that it's funny. Love to hate. Yeah. Dr. Galt ends up calling and summons Snow and tells him that he has to go into the arena. And he felt, quote, like a wild bird in a cage, end quote. (laughs) Yeah, this is such a huge moment of change for him. I feel like we've seen the progression of he's thinking about control more and the importance of that but then when he's thrown into this arena and it's chaos he clings on to the fact that control is everything more than ever Mm -hmm. and that's when he's chased down in the dark by tributes including bobbin Mm -hmm. who as emily mentioned is murdered by snow so that is the first person that snow kills and we know that there's three people that Snow kills by the end of this book. And this is body number one, life number one. And he changes. Yeah. And then there's a very interesting conversation between Dr. Gall and Snow once he makes it out of the arena. She basically mm-hmm. tells him that she wanted him to go into the arena. It was a lesson for him and that she wanted him to see what humanity was really like. Dr. Gall says, what happened in the arena, that's humanity undressed. The tributes in you two, how quickly civilization disappears. All your fine manners, education, family background, everything you pride yourself on, stripped away in the blink of an eye, revealing everything you actually are. A boy with a club who beats another boy to death. That's mankind in a natural state. And so we go back to those quotes at the beginning of the book, and we can clearly see where Dr. Gall stands on this idea of Hobbes and Rousseau and Locke and we start to see this because then Dr. Gall asks them and I like that the marketing is focusing on this is who are human beings because who we are determines the type of governing we need and that's Mm -hmm. a a huge valid in a nutshell (laughs) yeah exactly and then she assigns the next assignment which is the value of control And then that's when he starts going into chaos and what sort of social contract is required, what's lawlessness like in the arena. And he goes home. And I think something interesting is that just to note, Tigress has a ratty fur coat on that had been her mother's, which is her security blanket, which is that something that she's wearing in Mockingjay, a ratty fur coat? Hmm interesting just a thought but anyway then juno who is bobbin's mentor starts to question what is foul play in the arena because juno's like we never saw bobbin's death what what happened and so is there foul play in the arena which we later learn that there's only one rule in the trilogy in the arena and that's cannibalism like there's no cannibalism Mm -hmm. it's pretty much a lawless land so the plinth prize ends up being announced whoever's mentoring the victor is going to get a full ride scholarship to the university so Mm -hmm. that gives snow even more motivation to make sure that lucy gray is the victor and Mm -hmm. back in the arena we get jessup appearing rabid in the arena Mm -hmm. and that closes us out on chapter 16. then we get to chapter 17 which we find out that dogs in the capital actually had rabies during the dark days and that's mm-hmm. likely what spread it to jessup could have been the raccoons at the zoo and it's interesting because the mentors say that jessup brought it from the district so there's this huge discussion on animal existence and 
tribute's existence again. In the arena, we get the hydrophobia scene. Jessup ends up dying, and then Lucy Gray and Snow end up winning the most popular vote. Mm-hmm. Cute. <laughs> Popularity, you know, like it, it reminds me of uh, Homecoming King and Queen or Prom King and Queen. But the joy does not last very long because Snow gets home and Tigress has the tax bill that has finally come. Feeling a little bit broke, unfortunately. <laughs> so, chapter 18 Coriolanus realizes, oh no, I need to protect my appearance. This is when he starts using the plinths for their money as a reward mm-hmm. for helping Sidney. Yeah, he thinks about it earlier, but now he's He's like, okay, this tax bill has shown up. I got to take this into my own hands. Hopefully I can go get some money from the plants. While that's happening on TV, Lucky brings on Dean Highbottom. And Dean Highbottom notes the new interactivity of the games. He means the bombing changed the landscape. And he says, it's a brand new arena and it's made the tributes behave in a brand new way. It's a lot more offensive. It seems like people are on the offense. We have kind of like a career pack building is what I refer to as like Mizzen and Coral and Tanner. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see that. And I can assume that that probably didn't happen in previous games. And then once Tanner dies, Tanner's mentor says, be careful who you trust in and out of the arena with Lepidus. Another line that I thought was important that connected to the original trilogy from chapter 18 was Domitia, Tanner's mentor, says... Tanner was a very good natured person and District 4 took advantage of that, which immediately makes me think of Cato when he dies at the end of the 74th games because they took advantage of what could have been a good natured young life and made him into this killer Mm -hmm. so we start to see that connection instantly in ballad and then meanwhile we kind of didn't mention this but i think something important to know about the games is that reaper's on a hunger strike and then it comes up in chapter 18 about using hunger as a weapon, which has always been Suzanne's, like one of her main arguments to address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how the rebels almost took the capital. And so then Coriolanus goes to the lab for a checkup and he hears the word arena and games being thrown around by a couple of lab employees who have a tank of snakes. And it was just announced that Gaius Breen, the mentor, had died. So... He's kind of like on the lookout. And so he's in the elevator as these employees and he has, he has the guts to ask, where are you taking the snakes? And they go another lab, but then they give each other a look. And then he starts piecing together different things. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gallus said to him about like his girl giving her the idea and without knowing quite how, Coriolanus found the handkerchief in his hand, neatly balled up like a prop in one of Lucky's magic tricks. And he drops it into the tank with Lucy Gray's scent on it. End of chapter. And it's iconic because then in chapter 19, he just goes into a huge panic. Oh yeah. He freaks out about what he's done at the very beginning of chapter 19. And then he ends up visiting Mr. Plinth, who doesn't give him any money. <laughs> He offers some whiskey and he's like, no money though. Like, sorry. Unfortunately. (laughs) During his conversation with Mr. Plinth, I think it's interesting because we get this dynamic of family and he brings up, you look like your father, but you're nothing like him. Maybe you take after your mother, huh? She was always gracious to me when I came here on business before the war, despite my background. So even though he was district, his Snow's mother treated him with absolute kindness. Interesting. At the beginning, you can say that Corio maybe could have been a little bit like his mother, potentially. Mm-hmm. Not quite so, but a little good. But now his dad has clearly entered yeah. the picture who's not I, being I a nice like guy. I feel like in the story, we see Snow kind of deciding which path to take. Is he going to go more in the direction of his mother or his father? And then he has to go home and work on his essay. And I feel like this is where some other important lines come up, fueled by the terror of being prey, how quickly he himself had become a predator with no reservations about smashing Bob into death. He transformed all right, but not into anything he was proud of. And I think that quote is very important because he's not proud of his actions. And I feel like that's clear from President Snow to Katniss. Like, I feel like he's not proud of himself, but he's proud of the Snow name for remaining in Mm -hmm. power. And that quote they ended up putting in the film, but Mm -hmm. attributing it to Dr. Gall, fueled Mm -hmm. by the terror of becoming prey. That's a Dr. Gall line. So I think it just shows 
the fact that they were able to just switch that snow line over to Dr. Gall shows how kind of closely their thinking is mm-hmm. at this point, like how much she's molded and influenced him. Towards the end of this chapter is when we get the snakes coming into the arena and Lucy Gray mm-hmm. emerges from the stand singing with them and the quote, with the tips of her fingers, she spread her ruffles out in the dust as if by a way of invitation. As the snakes swarmed her, the faded fabric vanished, leaving her with a brilliant skirt of weaving reptiles, which I think is a little bit too fantastical but like seeing what they're doing with the movie, I want to hear mm-hmm. your thoughts. Like, do you like how they're portraying I the I think snake? it looks so good. I think they leaned into it being very scary mm-hmm. in that moment. That one still that we've kind of seen the snakes all around her. She's kind of holding up her hands and she just looks like so terrified. I mm-hmm. think it looks great translated to film from what we've seen so far yeah I was worried I remember reading this for the first time and being a little concerned but they're doing Mm -hmm. I feel like it looks great we are left with our final chapter in part two which is chapter 20 and the snakes get drawn to Lucy Gray what's important is what you said Lucy Gray is scared because she doesn't realize what's going on and Snow asks what did she think was keeping the snakes in check? Like, what would you think? I about? think she's thinks she's gonna die. For some reason, the snakes are delaying. Maybe she thinks the singing is doing something, but the song that she chooses, The Old There Before, which is probably one of my three favorite songs that I'm like really looking forward to in the movie. It's a song about dying and like leaving the world so I think she thinks she's gonna go I think those are some of the hardest moments especially in chapter 11 was it when she says that she knows she's going to die I think that that was really really hard so Mm -hmm. seeing her and I think think it's gonna be very emotional too because what we've heard of that scene and her singing that moment that people cried on set watching her do it very excited to be sad (laughs) which I also think it'll bring a new perspective to this scene because I didn't quite Mm -hmm. follow it in the books as much like the emotional side because we're reading a third perspective on snow and not Lucy Gray so I think we'll feel this a lot more yeah I think the both the reaping and this moment were which were kind of the two biggest moments that I just didn't get with Lucy Gray I think are really going to be enhanced in the film and then Lucy Gray starts to look at the tribute's bodies like we mentioned at the morgue and starts to count them and that's when one of the mentors suggests using the scoreboard to tell how many people have died or how many tributes Mm -hmm. are still left that's a part of the games that I think would be probably the most psychologically disturbing and hardest to heal from would be the fact like you don't know how many other competitors there still are yeah how long this is going to go on if you should really be trying or if you know you should just give up if you're maybe starving and just like barely holding on you might try to make it to the end if there's only one person left versus like if there's Mm -hmm. still 10 people left very interesting yeah. update to the games we make it to the final two so we have reaper and lucy gray and corylea starts thinking of lucy gray moving to the capital and him going to the academy with the plinth prize and her performing at pluribus's club and the point is this is a quote the point is he got to keep her so again more possessiveness lucy gray ends up chasing Reaper around, which we know. That's when we get Coriolanus getting taken to the lab. Snow lands on top, smiley face, we're winning, good news. Just kidding. Dean Highbottom is actually at the lab. And there, arranged on the table like lab specimens, were the three items. An academy napkin with stained grape punch, his mother's compact, and a dingy white handkerchief. The meeting could not have lasted more than five minutes. Afterward, as agreed, Coriolanus headed directly to the recruitment center where he became Pan Am's newest, if not shiniest, peacekeeper. Ah. End of part two. <laughs> Chaos. I think that ending was probably, we have here, like in our notes, least favorite parts of part two. That's probably one of my least favorite parts. I don't like that plot twist. I like part three the most. But I remember the disappointment. I, I always remember the disappointment when I read this. And mm-hmm. this is how like, this is going to go. Okay. Yeah. I wish we could have gotten that running reunion where they grab each other. Because I'm just that romantic person. You know what I mean? I mean, but we just got a kidding. reunion later in District 12. 
I know, but it's not what I wanted. I wanted him to go to the academy and I wanted her to go and be at Pluribus's club and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, <laughs> but well, things just go my, downhill. <laughs> things go downhill and that's part three. So we've gone through a lot. We've seen Snow's demise of his morals, I would say, creeping in. We've seen Snow transforming into this new character and we see him entering a new world we don't know what this means for part three what do you mean peacekeeper so stay tuned for part three which is coming out next week we will be concluding ballad and you can binge all three episodes to prepare yourself for ballad if you have done a reread or trying to get a reread in before the movie comes out but emily we are like a few weeks it's, away it's too soon <laughs> so join us for tribute talk Every Thursday night, 6.30 Pacific, 9.30 Eastern Time. Turn on your notifications. And until next time, we will see you for part three, The Peacekeeper. Bye. See ya.